So we're moving, we're changing tact slightly. <laughs> um, our next um, uh, uh, keynote speaker is Professor Marian Baird, um, who's Professor of Gender and Employment Relations, Head of the Discipline of Work and Organisational Studies and Co-Director of the Women, Work and Leadership Research Group in the University of Sydney Business School. Um, Marian's one of the Australia's leading researchers in the fields of women, work and care. She's chief investigator on a number of significant research grants, including the Centre of Excellence on Population Ageing Research and the Australian Women's Work Futures Project. And she spoke at our conference a couple of years ago as well. She's very engaged with a range of government departments, organisations, unions, not-for-profits to improve Australian workplace policies and the position for women at work and in society more broadly. Her keynote address today is All the Cares in the World, Work-Life Concerns of Mature Workers. Very in bed. Good morning, everyone, and thank you very much um, for inviting me to speak to you this year. I'll just get the yeah. clicker. So, yeah, forward. Yeah, perfect. Thank you, and thanks again for the introduction, and um, thank you very much for the speech that I was fortunate to hear most of. Um, Gabriel, that sounds like... Well, something that I think we all realise, being in those situations, you, um, you realise two things, that lots of other people are in a similar situation because you come across them, and that crises drive the next set of behaviours and, and responses, which is unfortunate. And I was just reflecting with my colleague here, Alison Williams, about is that the way? Do we have to just face up to the fact that that is the way we manage care in Australia? It's sort of crisis management from one issue to the next. And should we just build our so services and supports around that? But I want to um, take you down a slightly different path this morning. And um, this is to present to you some of the most recent results we have from work that I mentioned to you last time I spoke to this conference. I know not everyone was at the previous one, so I will do a little bit of a fill in the gaps. Um, and my focus is on people in the workplace, men and women who are at work, um, and how they manage the informal care responsibilities they have. So in this, in this presentation, we're focusing on people who provide care for people in their family, who are sick, their children, their grandchildren, those with a disability and elders. So the full range of care. But also we're very interested in this other issue of how um, our population is maturing, which means our labour force is maturing, but it's bringing into conflict two policies ageing in place and having more people in the workforce. And those two policies are essentially at odds with each other. So I want to talk about that. And um, I'd like to begin with a reflection or a story that also um, brought home to me just last week how stressful this situation is and how people are managing their lives for the people they love and also being committed to work. And I was speaking at a conference of um, people who work in banks, largely tellers, so not the senior executive who are earning millions, but the people who service us in our local communities. And quite a few of those relayed stories, and I just want to tell you one. Um, this was a woman, she's 61. She works in her local branch as a teller every day. Every morning, her father's 92. He still lives at home and close by. He has just got the beginning of dementia, so he can manage himself mostly, but he needs attention during the day. So every morning she gets up, she goes to his place, dresses him, gives him breakfast, and he manages the morning. She goes to work. At about midday, he then decides to visit her. This happens three or four times a week at work. So he can still work, find his way to the shopping centre that she works in. So he goes down to visit her at work and they say hello and I don't know if she gives him lunch. He then sits in the shopping centre for the next three to four hours until she can work, walk him home and that's his care arrangement. And I thought, oh my goodness. Um, but on top of that, she still has a mortgage and her superannuation totals 120000 so she's in a position where she can't leave work to care for her father, 
where they are trying hard to work out how to organise the family finances to put him into a good home. Um, and this brings all these issues, I think, together that people in Australia are struggling with. Work, care, and particularly women, low superannuation accounts and poorly paid jobs. The jobs that those women do, I checked on this later, um, they earn 35 to 50,000 a year. And if you've been into a local branch lately, you can see the stress on those workers too because those branches are not organised for people to um, have fun in. There are, they're so short-staffed, which is the other issue that came up, that all the women who work in those banks who have caring responsibilities, and especially if they're in regional and rural Australia, do not want to take time off work because the bank has to close because there's no one else to fill there's no other staff. The banks aren't providing extra staff. And because the banks are so critical to those communities, those people feel committed to their communities too. So we're, I think, in this really difficult position about who is caring in Australia? Who are they caring for? What types of care are they providing? And what impact is it having on them as workers? So that's what I want to sort of give you some background on today. And just to um, give you a little bit of a, a sort of a, um, the context for this research, and I'm going to flip through quite a few graphs, so please just take it in as pretty pictures this morning because I'll summarise what they're all saying, but I do want to give you some data. But this is the sort of classic story we have in Australia today, and not just Australia, most advanced economies, that the population is ageing and, um, and by where are my figures here, sorry, but by 2056, which is quite a long time off, I know, but that will come to us, 8.7 million older Australians are predicted to be in Australia, but also because there's so many older people not working and the population size going into the workforce is decreasing in relation to that, what we call the dependency ratio, we're going to have a much higher dependency ratio, so more workers having to look after older people. Um, the big shift that's happened in Australia is this issue about who actually is going into the workforce. Now I don't want to give you a whole lecture on labour market economics but just look at where I've put that sort of orangey line. Over the last 40 years women's workforce patterns have changed so dramatically that um, that is the biggest social shift that's happened in Australia and women who are 45 or 50 and older have gone into the labour market in huge numbers. There's over a 30% increase in women in the labour market um, of that age. And they're also of the age who are providing care to a lot of people. Now we do have to note that these people often don't work full-time hours. They are working part-time hours and some of them work part-time hours in order to combine their work and care responsibilities. So in that context, we, um, I am and colleagues are part of a much larger um, research grant, Australian Research Council grant, which is called the Centre of Excellence on Population Ageing Research. It has four dimensions, macro demographic dynamics, the changing population, um, decision making and expectations and decision making expectations and cognition as people age sustainable well-being in later life and then the, the fourth element that I'm looking at with colleagues is organisations and the mature workforce. So the other elements tend to be more related to um, the medical and psychological fields and ours is really the workplace and what is happening in Australian workplaces. Um, the issue that we have to realise, of course, as I've already said, is that we are getting older people in our workplaces just by virtue of the way in which our population dynamics are changing. Um, we also have lower fertility rates and there is a, another bit of research we've done which suggests that younger people are m far more ambivalent about having more than one child now and sort of a little bit of a thought that maybe we're moving into a one-child society by virtue of our economics and social structures. Um, and this all puts pressure on us, on us as a population and a society. Um, in gerontological research, old or mature is usually 65 and above. 
but in workplace research and organisational studies, mature age workers are 45 and above. So it doesn't take long before you become a mature age worker. Um, okay, so this, this year, to um, sort of provide a benchmark, a set of statistics and numbers that we could understand what's happening in Australia with mature age workers, we conducted and have just um, finalised the analysis of our data. We conducted a survey of over 2,000 Australian workers aged 18 to 81 years in a wide range of industries. Um, we did uh, deliberately focus on 45 to 54 and 55 to 64, so we made sure in our sample that we did get um, those respondents in, so one third of 45 to 54 and one third of 55 to 64, and 9 per cent are 65 and over. So uh, we then are able to weight these, this data to the Australian population, etc. And what I want to do is just share with you a small portion of those results. Some of this you'll say, yes, I, I sort of knew that because you're living and working in this area. But it's useful for us as researchers to have this benchmark because what we want to do is track changes in Australia over time, but also we're going into separate workplaces and organisations and we will use this benchmark data to compare their specific organisational data against. So we'll be able to do sort of industry and workplace comparisons with the pattern in Australia. So what is happening in Australia? Probably um, not surprising. Uh, in the two age groups that I want to focus on, this is the average number of hours worked per week by our respondents. And this actually matches pretty well ABS statistics as well. Although it's slightly higher for women in the 45 to 59 year old age group, working 33 um, hours a week or nearly 34 is actually a bit higher than women who are slightly younger who tend to go back down to 20 to 25 hours when they've got children. So that graph I showed you of women re-entering the labour market, not only do they are more women returning after they've had children, but their hours then start to go up again until you get to about 60 and then some withdrawal from the labour market occurs as well. Um, how many of these people who are in the workplace, so remember this is people who are working, have care responsibilities. And here we can see that men actually report having more care responsibilities than women. And that may seem a little bit puzzling, but I think it's also because many women who have care responsibilities are actually not in the labour market. So here we're reporting on those who are in the labour market. Um, I did say there are lots of graphs, so I am, you know, moving through this, but we can, you can ask questions and we can return to them. Um, we know that in Australia, people who are providing informal care provide it for a range of reasons. So the highest group and the one we've spent most attention on and research on and policy attention over the last 20 years has probably been children. So the emphasis on the parental leave campaign that I was heavily involved in, the provision of childcare and trying to get a good childcare system in Australia, which I admit we still don't have, but um, we, do ha we do know a lot about that area of care and the problems in there. We also know that mature age workers in Australia and mature people, grandparents, provide a lot of grand parenting care to their grandchildren. Um, the elder care one we have spent far less attention on in Australia and you can see in this graph that it is actually popping up now as um, a significant, in terms of overall issues, um, responsibility of workers in Australia. They're also looking after the disabled and sick and their spouses. And this is um, a fairly familiar pattern that we see in other countries as well, that men at work still often um, report that they are looking after their spouse. That's their care responsibility. So we do see a higher number, proportion of men reporting that they're looking after their spouse than women are reporting on that. And of course, I have to say, men tend to, at the moment, die at an earlier age, so um, women may not have spouses still to look after, or they may be divorced. But here we get into what is it about care that may affect people's ability to work, 
and their, um, the stresses placed on them as employees. So the question we asked is, is we, we asked respondents to sort of list a whole range of things about what it was like to provide care. And this one response is, is providing care predictable or unpredictable? And here we see that people do report that it is pre unpredictable. So you can see the darker bar at the end is the proportion of females and males in those age groups reporting that providing care is unpredictable. Uh, and we do know that providing care for elders, for sick and the disabled is far more unpredictable than providing care for children, where you tend to know the patterns of children's um, life. You know they're going to be at home for a period of time, then go to preschool and school. Whereas for those who have disabilities or other sicknesses or um, are elderly, we also know how unpredictable that is. And I think that's one of the greatest stresses on people and is one of the greatest requirements of employees in terms of their search for flexibility. How do they manage the visits to the doctor, um, the search for or the interactions with Centrelink or My Age Care or whatever other areas where it takes a lot of time and patience. Um, they also report that providing care increases as people get older. So as time goes on, there's great recognition that the demands on you to provide care increases. Um, but here we see, does providing care interfere with family life? And this is a classic question in work-life studies. And you can see here that most people, well, the majority of people disagree with that. So providing care is not necessarily um, interfering with family life. Now we have to drill down into this data more, but I suspect what people are really saying, well, this is my family. So providing care is what I do as a family. So it's not actually interfering with my life, but it is my life. Um, and that's a, a comment for researchers to consider about maybe the way we frame our questions and consider this area. Does providing care interfere with work? The other spillover effect, care spilling over into work. And here we see that there is slight, the patterns are slightly different, but particularly for women who are in the 45 to 59 year old age group, um, over a third of those women do report that providing care is interfering with their work. Um, but then as they get older, it doesn't interfere with work. Now that may be because our older people 60 plus have actually withdrawn from the labour market um, and no longer have that tension of providing care because they're doing that outside of being at work. Is providing care stressful? And here we see that it is, particularly for men who are older, for women 45 to 59 and for women 60 and above. So providing care does put stress on people. Has it been difficult for me to fulfil my family carer responsibilities because of the amount of time I spend on the job? Now this, this report is actually um, slightly surprising to us because we do hear that there's a lot of um, tension amongst people. So I think two things might be happening. The majority of people here are reporting that, um, oh, I'm sorry, thank you got the wrong one. The majority of people here are reporting that um, it's not that difficult to fulfil their care responsibilities um, because of the time they spend at work. So somehow people are managing to be at work and care despite the fact that they're reporting higher levels of stress, increasing unpredictability, etc. So we've got that whole picture of um, what is happening at workplaces and how people are managing their care responsibilities, their multiple, sometimes, care responsibilities. Now I want to return to the, women, the woman I spoke about and her financial reasons for, for working. And part of our research is actually to take a very, a very specific gender lens to the data because a lot of research on pensions, retirement, etc., does not specifically discuss women. And you will have seen in the latest um, inquiry um, terms of reference a lack of reference to women's retirement and there's been a, a, a demand to include that in the inquiry terms of reference. 
But here we see why do people continue to work when they're older? And the rest, the, these sets of slides really show that for women, financial stress is really important. For men it is as well, but for women it ranks higher. So they need the income. And then we go through those other reasons that they do enjoy that work. It is a sense of purpose. They do want to say, stay active and productive. They do want to stay involved with people and they need the benefits. So work brings to people many other, um, many other positive benefits apart from finance, but finance is very important. And so in this one, sorry, I'm not pressing hard enough. In this one, we see that for women, they are really dissatisfied or feel that their current financial situation is not good enough for them and that really puts pressure on them to need to keep working. So we're picking up quite strongly the need to continue work because of um, gender and age. And here we see even stronger responses, I feel considerable financial pressure to continue working amongst women. So I think this is a looming problem in Australia. I mean, we are seeing a lot of attention to the sort of um, results of that in these discussions of lower superannuation funds. But it's an issue that starts much earlier in life. It starts when women enter the workforce and have their children, and then um, it compounds all the way through. So what do we know so far from our first look at our results? We know that a lot of informal care is being provided by Australians, both men and women, to children, to their grandchildren, to elders, to those with a disability and to spouses. And we also know that mature workers are spending around double the amount of time caring for elders um, than they do for their grandchildren. And so that's an issue I think we can um, put more attention on when we do further research and even think about it in the press, when we're communicating with people and with employers in particular. Secondly, we know that combining care and work does have some downsides. Um, people do report it gets harder with time, it's unpredictable and it's stressful. The lower, the lower rankings are that it interferes with their work and it interferes with their family life. So we're not getting that tension expressed in that way although they're recognising the other problems with providing care. Um, why do Australian women continue to work when they have these care um, responsibilities? Well, it's mainly because they need the income more than the men do. Um, they also don't want to reduce their hours often because perhaps working gives them social interaction and some sense of purpose and enjoyment in their lives. And most people in Australia, older people, despite our assumptions about women and men who are older not wanting to embrace technology, do put effort into that and want to continue to train. So some implications, and I'd be interested to hear what you think of these, this data too, because literally this is our first cut of it and the first time we've presented it. Um, we do feel that be, even though mature workers are working primarily because of, their, of the financial necessity, especially amongst women, they are still committed to working and to keeping current at work, but they're also carers and they're committed to being carers. And one thing that comes through is that working men also have complex caring needs. Um, Around half of the working carers were concerned about the unpredictability of care and their care needs increasing and the stress increasing as well. And at the next stage of our research is really taking these issues into workplaces and talking to employers about how their policies, for example, their flexible work policies, may be not being targeted to the right groups or all groups in organisations. We know, for example, that women with children do use flexible work policies, but we know that men tend not to use flexible work policies. So there may be some more work we can do within workplaces to provide um, both men and women who've got caring responsibilities to meet those demands more easily. So our survey is just the start. Um, we are, and if you have an organisation who you might, who you think might be interested, we're very interested in working with organisations. Um, about promoting successful ageing at work. And I've only spoken to you about a quarter of our um, 
current project, we're also looking at work design, health and wellbeing at work, and the way in which workers maintain um, particular types of knowledge, what we call um, um, crystallised knowledge, which people tend to have as they get older, versus the sort of knowledge which is very fluid that people have when they're younger. Um, so we're interested in working with more employers. So if you know any employers who might be interested, please ask them to contact us. And um, if you would like more information about the project overall, please go onto our website. We constantly update that with information about not just our project, but other projects in Australia, news items, good news stories, sometimes bad news stories, but trying to get that conversation and dialogue going. Thank you very much. So there's, there's time for a couple of questions, um, if there's one over here. Microphone. Thanks, Marion. Thank you. Thanks. Hi, Marion. Hi. Hi. Thank you. Um, it was probably more I picked up on, you said I'm really interested in your thoughts. Mm. Just three really quick ones. Right. Um, one is that <clears throat> whilst I earn a higher dollar an hour rate, I work casually yeah. and he doesn't. So he, um, you know, he takes on a lot more of the um, release opportunities around the caring role um, because otherwise I don't get paid for that period. So I guess that casual versus permanency of the workforce. I think that's a really good point and we can separate the data out like that and it's very critical, yeah. Um, second point is... He does a lot of the practical things like go, does the legwork, goes to the appointments, those sorts of things. I end up doing the really high abstract advocacy style things. Mm. Um, and so, at, like time-wise, he puts in a lot more than I do physically, mm. but I'm stuck with the mess, you know, yeah. that sort of thing. Yeah. Can um, I ask, is this to provide elder care or...? A different sort of care? Uh, child with disability. Right. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, and the third one um, was um, just, a, just a comment. Socially, he's, mm. he's um, praised for all of this, yeah. whereas I'm kind of assumed for it. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> thank you. That's a great one. I think we've got to put a question in about that. Um, so thank you very much because what you've done there is really highlight the different roles that men and women play in care. So it's not just that men are providing care, but it's a type of care and what they do. Yeah. And that issue about permanent and casual is so important. So thank you very much. And I've noted those and we'll include those. One more. Yep, over here. Oh. Thank you. Um, I just wanted to provide some commentary oh, as well. I thank have, you. I have two children that I care for and I've also cared for my sister and two elderly parents mm. and have had some health issues of my own. One of the things that um, I've experienced is some of the financial impost and that relates to career compromise I've had to make over the years. Yeah. So whilst I work and um, have attempted flexible work, it's really driven where I've been able to work. Yeah. And that's also driven me towards thinking about uh, future implications because I'm a woman of a certain age that didn't have the super early on. Yep. But the second part to that for me, it's the day-to-day -day stuff. Mm. The, the amount of money that I've had to pay out for just basic doctor's appointments, medications, et cetera, that can't be claimed through Medicare, NDIS, My Aged Care, anything else. Yeah. Um, the cost of travel. So yes. it's the day-to-day -day here and now costs that also um, influence where and how I work. Um, and that's made, again, significant impacts on... Um, our relationships, our quality of life, etc. And I'd also agree with the comment that the previous speaker yeah. mentioned about the amount of recognition that you get um, as a woman doing some of this about the expectation. It's still, mm. it's still a lot of expectation. And I actually find it um, in a number of workplaces I've been around there feels like there's more acceptance for people to take parental leave for kids, for school and HSC and things. But mm. the moment you bring... Uh, an obligation for somebody with a complex uh, chronic health issue or a disability, I still feel a lot of rolled eyes because it's seen as something that's really drudgy and ongoing and people 
Yeah. Switch off to hearing about Look, it. thank you so much. I, you know, your comment about career compromise, it's so true, and we do have quite a bit of um, data in the, in the study about those. Did you have to shorten your hours, not go for promotion, not accept a training offer, not go for another job? And I will, we will be exploring that because I think it's really um, an important factor. And as we say, it builds into then what your end of working life earnings will be and what you can contribute to your own superannuation. Yeah. Because I work, I recently lost the carer's allowance. And while that isn't a significant amount, it does. It was paying chemist bills and things. Absolutely. So it's yeah. just, you know, one of those negative aspects of working. So, again, that eats into career Your, compromise, etc. Yeah, yeah. Yep. thank you very much. And I agree with you. The day-to-day -day costs, especially the travel one, um, which we don't factor in in any way, and the waiting room time, the time you just spend doing those things. Yeah, thank you. Lots I think of questions. we'll probably can we do one, one minute, more? so we can probably take one, and then maybe catch up at, up at yeah, morning sure, tea. Yeah, sure. Hello. Um, I was really interested in your projections for mature age workers and just the general population. Mm. Uh, and I wonder what you see for the next generation of mature age workers, because already the system is currently in stress with people continuing yeah. to pay off mortgages. Um, people in their 20s and 30s and 40s are currently facing incredible employment insecurity and also housing insecurity and probably will never even be able to purchase mm. an apartment or a house mm. in many cases. And so we'll be renting for the rest of their lives and completely unable to stop working. Um, and so it seems that a system already under stress will be heading towards effectively a bit of a demographic time bomb. And I wonder what your research has told you about that and if we can do anything to... Uh, sort of yeah. help that, assuming that we can't, you know, change house prices and things. Yeah, I agree. <laughs> so, I mean, that's a really good question and it's really the question that um, has made me turn to a much more life course analysis, not, not just of individuals but of our whole social policy framework. And at the moment, unfortunately, most of our policies are really um, siloed into different areas. So we have elder care here, child care here, and we don't do much about inter linking them. Um, another study we're just, we're just publishing in the Australian Journal of Sociology, which is sort of interesting because it is about that yo younger cohort, the 16 to 40 year olds, and what they, how they're managing with life now and what they say they need in order to thrive in work and family in the future. And that's where I picked up that issue of are they going to have children? The women are basically saying no. They're not going to have Women who've got a child now are the least likely to say they'll have another child. And even women who... can confirm that. You can confirm that. So there you go. <laughs> it's lovely when your big data sort of comes to the individual. And the women who have no children are also very ambivalent about having children. So I think this is a, this is a, a huge problem for Australia because if you don't have fertility, your population, by virtue of the maths actually continues to age. And the only way you can bring in the younger population is immigration. And so then we enter another whole policy debate, as you can imagine. So these are intertwined policy areas. And I think, um, I don't have a solution to your question, but I think we really- a lot to ask. But, I, <laughs> but it is my concern too. And the only thing I'd say is if we're having fewer children that maybe our children, like my children, who still don't have children, will be able to look after me because they don't have the children to look after. But I wish they had children, so <laughs> I'm caught. I suppose my point is also if they yeah. are unable to give up work or even go part-time because they are renting and, yep. renting and they their don't. entire lifetime, yep. they will not even have the security of possibly being able to pay off that mortgage one day and live on a, a slightly lower income in order to fulfil their caring responsibility. Yeah, so this is where this whole issue of intergenerational transfer of money comes in and funds, but then you... You can see what's happening, even beginning with that little story I said about the woman who's 61. She still hasn't actually paid off her mortgage, so she doesn't have much to hand on to her children and doesn't have a lot of super. So those, I think, what we can predict pretty certainly is that those divisions are going to get greater. Um, and then all the other social consequences of that, unless we intervene. And that actually means different tax policies. Um, that's not a very positive note. <laughs>
have to leave you with. No, it's not, but I'll. Oh, thank you. That'll make me feel good. That's right. <laughs> Thanks, thank you Lena, very and much. And thank you very much. Thank, thank you. you. I'm, I'm sorry we didn't get to all the questions um, there, uh, but hopefully you can catch up with Marion um, at morning tea.